Hola, muy buenos días a todos y bienvenidos al primer webinar de Salmo Food. Para los que no hemos tenido la oportunidad de conocernos, mi nombre es Ernesto Pasalacua, gerente comercial de Salmo Food, una marca de Vita Pro. Hoy estamos muy contentos de poder contar con todos ustedes en este primer encuentro virtual que tendrá como propósito introducirnos en una temática productiva contingente, como es la calidad del filete de salmón. Sabemos que la contingencia actual nos impide reunirnos físicamente, pero tengan por seguro que Salmofood siempre ha privilegiado mantener el contacto cercano con cada uno de ustedes. Sin embargo, creemos firmemente que este tipo de herramientas digitales han llegado para quedarse. En este escenario, en Salmofood, nos mantenemos firmes ante la responsabilidad de brindar mejores herramientas y conocimiento técnico, como parte de nuestro propósito de transformar la acuicultura para nutrir el mañana. La adaptación al cambio nunca fue tan relevante para la continuidad de nuestra vida durante estos días, como también lo es para las personas y compañías que juegan un rol fundamental en la cadena de la alimentación mundial. Estamos muy entusiasmados por iniciar este ciclo de seminarios virtuales, donde la transferencia de conocimiento, el compartir experiencias y mantener las relaciones cercanas son algunos de los pilares de nuestra propuesta de valor. Hoy contaremos con dos expositores internacionales que participan activamente en nuestro TNC Salmo Food, TNC Technical Nutritional Committee. Jens Eric Dessen y Thomas Larsson, ambos son doctores de la University of Life Sciences en Noruega y actualmente investigadores del Departamento de Nutrición y Tecnología de los Alimentos de Nofima, quienes nos brindarán sendas exposiciones acerca de 1. Investigación en acuicultura de gran escala y calidad de cosecha. Y dos, manchas oscuras en el filete de salmón y firmeza del filete. Ambas exposiciones tienen como finalidad, en no más de dos horas totales, brindarnos elementos que la ciencia dispone para entender fenómenos tan comunes como la melanosis, gaping y cracking. Pero antes de comenzar, quiero pasarles algunos datos útiles que les pueden ser muy relevantes durante estas dos horas. Uno, les quiero mencionar que en la esquina superior izquierda de su pantalla, ustedes cuentan con dos botones de color rojo. Uno de esos botones es para realizar preguntas. Durante, en cualquier minuto de cualquier presentación, ustedes pueden pinchar ese botón y escribirnos a través del chat de la plataforma eh, las preguntas que les vayan surgiendo inmediatamente. Nosotros vamos a recopilar esas preguntas y las vamos a hacer todas al final de la presentación de cada uno de los expositores. Al costado de ese botón también hay un botón también de color rojo que eh, les permite o les permitirá en cualquier minuto de la presentación seleccionar el idioma. Tienen dos opciones. Pueden seleccionar el idioma español en el cual van a disponer de una traducción simultánea de todas las presentaciones que se harán, que se harán en inglés o poner el idioma original de sala. Es decir, cuando yo hable en español o en inglés, escucharán español o inglés, y en las presentaciones que serán en inglés, escucharán en inglés. Al final de la presentación de cada expositor, daremos algunos minutos para responder las principales preguntas enviadas. Si son muchas que creemos que van a ser, eh, vamos a seleccionar las, las principales. Les pido disculpas a aquellos que van a hacer algunas preguntas y probablemente eh, 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 quien fuera, pero en honor al tiempo y para respetar eh, los tiempos asignados tanto de los, de los expositores como de ustedes, vamos a seleccionar las principales. Luego, les recuerdo también que es posible durante las presentaciones ampliar la pantalla de tal manera que puedan tener acceso en todo minuto a los detalles de cada uno de los gráficos y datos expuestos. También no quiero dejar pasar poder entregarles algunos datos prácticos que no solamente servirán para este webinar, sino que para cualquier otro que ustedes puedan tener. En primer lugar, recuerden tener una muy buena señal de internet. Eso es fundamental para una buena experiencia. Dos, disponer de un adecuado sistema de audio, muy bien configurado. Yo, en este caso, estoy ocupando un micrófono y audífonos para poder eh, eh, escuchar bien. Y en tercero, siéntase cómodo y disfruten el evento. Están en sus casas. Espero que ustedes disfruten de este webinar tanto como nosotros hemos disfrutado organizándolo. Nos hemos tomado el tiempo y esperamos que realmente lo disfruten. Today, our first presentation will be shared by Dr. James Eric Dessen. 
Dr. Jessen, Dessen sorry, joined Nofima in 2012 and works as a scientist within the Department of Nutrition and Fit Technology. He is responsible for the coordination of large-scale experiments within Nofima's R&D licenses. Dr. James Eric Dessen received his PhD within the field of fish nutrition from the University of Life Sciences in, Nor in Norway in 2018. He holds a Bachelor and Master of Sciences within the aquaculture from the same university. His primary research area include the influence of dietary protein to lipid ratio on growth, feed utilization, health and biometric parameters in Atlantic salmon. Previously, Dr. Dessen has worked as an operating biologist at Leroy Seafood, and he is an enthusiast of applied and commercially relevant research. I leave you with Dr. Jens Eric Dessen, who will present us aquaculture research in large scale and quality at harvest. What is important to consider? Dr. Dessen, the microphone is yours. And gracias, thank you. I will start for sharing my screen. Okay, thank you so for the introduction. <clears throat> and I will now have this webinar together with you about the final product quality. And there will be me and uh, Thomas Larson presenting today. So we're honored to get the invitation for this webinar. Um, Nofima, <clears throat> former Aquaforsk, is uh, had had a collaboration with Salmon Food for over 20 years. And here you can see some of the collabor collaborators and uh, with Tudbir Noskor as a central person. Um, for those of you that don't know Nofima very well, uh, we have uh, headquarters in Tromsø in the northern Norway, and uh, we're spread in the whole Norwegian, um, in all of Norway, with Sundalsøra, where we have aquaculture facilities for trials, and in Bergen, where we have our feed technology center. We're in also Stavanger, and uh, me and uh, Thomas is situated in Ås. Um, where we have our, a lot of laboratories and uh, where we have our quality laboratory. So Nofima is owned mainly by the Norwegian government under the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Fisheries and some other um, organizations. Um, we're about 400 people and uh, have projects all over the world. And if you want more information about this, you can uh, visit our website. So today's topic is product quality and it can be defined um, in many ways but uh, important factors that define the product quality is of course the visual appearance the shape and the color it should have good taste texture and smell and it should be a good source of nutrients uh, safe to consume sustainable and uh, have a good shelf life um, in terms that you can process it and store it <clears throat> Uh, as you know, when many of you are salmon producers, uh, the main concept uh, is to produce uh, a smalt within a, a timeline where you, you set out the smalt from 100 to 500 grams, maybe depending on the size you want. Uh, and then you have a timeline from everything from 12 to 16 months. Um, and during that timeline, you have several different events that can challenge uh, your quality. It could be handling procedures, uh, delousing, sorting, or other stuff, um, moving the fish, where you have a lot of pumping and a lot of handling and pressure that will stress the fish. You can have disease outbreaks. You can have shifting environment in terms of uh, sea temperatures or oxygen that will vary through the surface and through season. <clears throat> you can have lice infections. And you can also, as the progression goes and the fish is bigger, you can also have problems with sexual mature fish before you reach harvest size. And you want to reach harvest size and have a high proportion of superior quality salmon. That, that's your goal. Uh, in the FIGMA, we, we like to see uh, how different uh, factors influence each other. 
and how they interact. And uh, all these parameters like production, environment and health really has an impact on quality. Uh, and we believe that increased biological understanding of the interaction between these different parameters will provide us with better overall solutions for farmers. Uh, Norway, as Chile, has a very long coastline, meaning that there is differences between the different regions, depending on where you are in the north, mid and south, and it will also vary photo period and also sea temperatures. In addition, due to these differences in environment, you also have differences in region uh, of disease outbreaks. In Norway, we have problems with pancreas disease, heart skeletal muscle inflammation, and also CMS, uh, heart failure. Uh, these are very common uh, problems in Norwegian aquaculture, and I'm going to focus a bit around these kind of factors and how they influence quality. However, to measure how the fish is performing and how the quality is, uh, 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 is during the production, we need biological control. But how? We have large pens uh, and we have uh, big harvest proce procedures. Um, so we, we, we want to, how do you get that biological control? Because uh, when we have the biological control over our biomass, we can learn about these factors and how they are affecting quality. Uh, in Nofema, uh, we have uh, received or applied for these R&D licenses that we have had now for two periods. Uh, and these uh, are um, R&D sites uh, with um, uh, four to six cages, uh, where we have minimum of four cages with, where we test two feeds, two feeds per cage. Uh, so there will be two tests and two control with 100,000 fish in each cage. And at the different sites, we have a maximum biomass capacity of 2,340 tons, meaning that we can produce it up to 5.5 kilos. So we have um, collaboration with uh, different uh, commercial producers uh, where we have on these different sites uh, with uh, Nulax in the north, Lere in the mid and Blom in the south. <clears throat> So in these R&D licenses, we practice uh, large-scale research. And large-scale research demands uh, kind of uh, different things and uh, how we have biological control and learn maximum out of these licenses uh, means that we have to have a very good starting point, meaning that we need to know the exact number of fish in the cage. Uh, we need to have exact uh, measurements of feed amount, everyday sea temperature, dead fish, and so on, and use uh, Excel or other programs that we will estimate the weight increase. And we also have good weight samples before set out, visiting the land-based farm before you set the fish out to sea, and also transferring one tank to one pen so that we have control over the number of fish. And this is also important in large scale commercial production. Uh, then you, we have the sampling of the fish. So we sample the fish at different production stages, often related to season and uh, weight intervals. Uh, we tend to measure 100 or more fish uh, at each cage uh, by uh, applying a landing net or catching net. Uh, where we have individual uh, of these 100 fish, we weigh them both length and weight. And then we take out what we mean is a representative sample of 10 fish that represents the average weight of this, uh, these fish and that respectively uh, respect pen. Uh, and these fish are used as indicators for color, texture, shape, and so on as the production cycles go. And then when we are reach the harvest and harvest size, we go to the slaughterhouse. We try to slaughter each pen within a short time span. Uh, preferably one to two days, depending on the uh, um, depending on the capacity of the slaughterhouse. Here we go to the slaughterhouse, and we uh, get the correct number and weight of the total pen. And we also do a checkup at the slaughterhouse, where we take out uh, twenty fish within each weight class. For example, if the average of the pen is five. We take out 20 fish of 5 kilos, 20 fish of 4 kilos, and 20 fish of 6 kilos. So one kilo up and one kilo down. These fish is then transported and 
analyze for color, texture, gaping, fat content, and so on, depending on the project. And we also use slaughter reports uh, of quality grading and so on to uh, detect different stages of production. Where did we go wrong or where, where, what did affect these kind of properties? Um, so sampling of fish, that's a very important for us. And we, we often use a large catching net uh, where we catch the fish in the pen. Then is the measurement of the weight and the length then take out 10 fish that would bleed out in water. And as I said, these fish is used as indicators of the quality status. Uh, we try to be quick and do it uh, in a good way by sedating the fish and also weighing the fish gently. And also they have a wake up tank and are going by themselves out with a pipeline to the pen again. Um, so let's take this sample procedures that we use. Um, so measurement of 100 fish per cage we take them out from the cage and by landing nets we do this continuous sampling using an ipad or a computer where we type in each uh, fish uh, along the way with the weight and length and we automatically um, calculate the condition factor of the fish and uh, we always have these kind of the average and when we come to a sufficient amount of fish, let's say 80 to 90 fish, we start out taking the average, let's say it's five kilos uh, or 5,000 grams. We take out 10 of these fish within this uh, weight uh, with the same condition factor as all the 100 fish so that we have a representative sample of the cage. Uh, these fish is then uh, scored and uh, analyzed uh, for uh, these 10 fish for health and quality status. Um, they are gutted and they are then stored whole or the cutlet on ice and then transported to a lab for analysis. Uh, we do it at our uh, here in Oz uh, in Ofima. Uh, so scoring of fish uh, is uh, a good uh, measure for us to do some different scoring that is health indicators. Uh, we score for uh, intestinal fats, uh, one to five. So one is low and five, then you see that the, the intestines and the viscera is covered by, by this uh, visceral fat. Con uh, fat. Um, and um, we also score the liver, the liver color, if it's pale or if it's normal, red brownish. Uh, we also score the gender of the fish. We can score for a scale loss, fin score, wound score and cataract. Those are the main ones that we do at the site just to get uh, a pinpoint of the health status. Um, fish is then gutted and waited to get the slaughter yield and then stored and transported. Um, so scoring of fish, uh, there is also a welfare guide that Nofima has developed together with other uh, institutes in Norway. It's uh, possible to download it from this link uh, and it's kind of this uh, morphological operational welfare score where you have different scoring of uh, different uh, aspects of production and welfare scores. Uh, and it's a good measure to, to use if you, you want to document something about welfare or also quality grading and so on. Um, for example, high intestinal fat score can indicate lower slaughter yield, high fat deposition that we know that can lead to a trigger inflammation if you get diseases, a low liver score that indicate a yellow with a pale liver is also often indicators for some kind of disturbance in nutritional status. Uh, we know that gender can affect color and fat content, I will come back to that. Uh, high fin score or wound scores can mean that you have high lice densities or that you've uh, conducted a bad uh, handling procedure. It can also indicate if there is any aggression in the cage uh, due to starvation or low feed supply or that the density is, is very high. Um, high cataract score can also indicate oxidative stress. Uh, low nutritional status, for example, if there's something wrong with a batch of feed in terms of histidine in, or, or, or minerals or antioxidants. 
and also it can indicate damage to the DI due to handling. So if something is off by these simple scores that anybody can do, you can take contact with the veterinary service or the fish health personnel to examine more in detail and take more uh, better uh, samples of wounds or uh, the heart in terms of QPCR and so on. Uh, so these are just simple scoring systems that can give you a sort of overview if there is something wrong or not. Um, after we've done some, some simple screening, uh, we do the analysis of, uh, of fish uh, from the samplings. We transported the, the fish uh, uh, to us, and here we have a lot of equipment that we can use for, uh, for different uh, quality traits that Thomas will, uh, will also uh, uh, get further into in terms of uh, um, what kind of measures we can do, but it's color and fat content we often do through PhotoFish, that is a rapid analysis uh, by a photometric analysis that will give you color and fat content. Uh, directly, we have a texture measurements, we can score for gaping, melanin score, and we have fillet machines so we can get an objective fillet yield, and you can also have different uh, uh, analysis towards what kind of fatty acids uh, proteins and so on, if you want to go more in detail. Um, so um, let's take some examples of, uh, of sampling in large scale. Um, just bear in mind that the, the seasons in Norway is opposite of Chile, uh, meaning that um, we have uh, low temperatures during uh, January, March, uh, in the winter time here, and then we come to May, uh, where we have an increase uh, and we have the highest temperatures in August, September, and then they get declines again in November. And also the photo period is, uh, is uh, declining in the um, uh, autumn period and increasing in the spring summer period. Uh, so the, bear in mind that we have opposite uh, seasonal effects. Um, here you can see an example from the Northern Norway and our R&D licenses there, where we're taking out, the, this is a one-year-old small set out in May, uh, about 100 grams. And then we sample it along the production line at different weight intervals and at different seasons. Uh, and then up to five kilos, we, we slaughter the fish. Uh, so this is uh, 13 to 14 months in sea. Uh, and during these samplings, uh, we'll f we follow the procedures as I, I showed you. And uh, often we do this to, to investigate seasonal effects and, and how the environmental shifts affect color. For example, in my example here, we're looking into fat content and uh, color. Um, and this is done by following these uh, four cages with 100,000 fish in. With two different feed types. One, the, the black, uh, um, blue one is the, the, the control feed with 35, 35 uh, in protein and 35 in fat versus uh, a test feed, uh, what we wanted to produce a 40% in protein and 30% in fat uh, to provoke differences in pro that we wanted to look at. Uh, However, they follow each other quite nicely. Here you can see the fat content in the Norwegian quality cut, that it's the, um, the cutlet that we use in Norway. Um, and uh, here's the fat content. You can see that the um, fat content in the fish increases a lot uh, during the autumn period, uh, first autumn period in sea. Uh, whereas in the winter when we're low temperatures and uh, low light, uh, there is not much happening and then you have an increase again during the, the spring and summer. Um, also here you can see the astaxanthin content in the same cutlet um, having more or less the same trend as the fat content. So these both reflect when the fish is growing and when the fish is storing fat and also how it how the color is affected by this. And we can see a quite seasonal effect uh, where the winter period is a challenge. Uh, seemingly that also you can plan out when to set out fish and when to slaughter fish. You want to try to uh, get up to over six uh, milligram per kilo of astaxanthin or uh, up to seven. So you have a, a nice color uh, and you also want an even color that is not very different between fish to fish, so a low variation is always uh, what you, you try to pinpoint out. 
Uh, also, we can do different tests uh, in these uh, li uh, uh, trials. Here we did just the effect of, uh, of uh, the carotenoid or pigmentation level in the fish. There has been some studies uh, um, that uh, um, uh, levels over 50 to 60 milligrams per kilo astaxanthin in the feed is, is uh, have a limited effect, but, but do season have an effect of this and how is it in, influenced in this large scale research done in uh, uh, production environment commercial scale. So we tested uh, um, uh, this in the mid of Norway, the same uh, procedure as I showed you before with the four cages two replicates per treatment and uh, high protein versus uh, standard control feed. Um, so um, I'll just do the like this. Uh, the fish uh, here was set out in the autumn. So it was a uh, autumn set out fish about 80 grams in November uh, where we followed the, uh, took some samples uh, from, from March and then uh, all the way to harvest. Uh, in the beginning, all groups got 50 milligrams of, of uh, astaxanthin, and uh, then from uh, August until November, the test group received uh, 70 milligrams uh, versus the control feed that received 50 milligrams per kilo. Uh, and we can see that during this period, by increasing it uh, from 50 to 70, we had a quite nice effect uh, at the, using the test feed. Um, uh, versus the control, uh, and that there was a significant higher content of astaxanthin, and you can also see it's reflected in the Salmo fan score. These are done by Photofish, and that m makes it an objective Salmo fan score and not subjectively scored by a random. Um, so, <clears throat> when we go further uh, from this November until the fish reaches slaughter size, uh, we did uh, something else. We, we uh, actually gave both groups 70 milligrams astaxanthin to see if that had an effect. And you can see in the winter period, uh, it didn't have any uh, effect. Uh, it didn't increase in this period at all for the two, uh, uh, two groups. Uh, so an increase after this season uh, for the control up to 70 didn't really help. Uh, so when the fish grows well and when the temperature is high, uh, it could indicate that, that this is an important period of, uh, of using more astaxanthin uh, to reach a, a higher level. Uh, and it also shows that sometimes you can use uh, 70 or 80 milligrams astaxanthin in your feed. Of course, it depends on the quality of the, your pigmentation source. Here we used uh, uh, astaxanthin synthetically, uh, so it was kind of controlled in that way. So it seems like uh, different temperatures and also for photo period may have an effect on, on the coloration of the fish. Uh, here's the same site. We, uh, we did the, the sampling here. Um, and uh, uh, what we saw when we sampled the fish at the slaughterhouse uh, uh, of five kilos, um, we could see that the, um, <clears throat> that the, um, um uh, frequency uh when we we uh slaughtered the fish uh, in the four kilo group there were mainly female fish uh and very few male fish whereas in the uh, five kilo the average of the pen it was 50 50 male and female and then the um sorry uh, then the for the six kilo groups they were mainly males um, and this made that we only took male in the six uh, kilo group and only female in the four kilo group, whereas the five kilo group, we took both female and male, so we can actually compare them. Um, what we saw then was that there was a difference in fat content between male and female fish. Uh, the female fish were, were fatter than, uh, had more fat content in the muscle than the male fish. Uh, in respective of uh, the dietary uh, treatments. Uh, and also we saw that the, uh, the uh, uh, of course, the 70 milligrams astaxanthin that we fed in the period had an, a good effect. So the overall, the test feed that got the 70 milligrams astaxanthin in the autumn period, um, summer autumn period had a generally higher 
astaxanthin content and salmofan in the in the mussel and we can also see that the the female fish was uh, within the same weight as the male fish uh, was also uh, slightly more colored uh, and had a higher color than the male fish so it seems like uh, the uh, purpose of color is not only to, to, to look nice for us to eat, but it has actually biological functions. The female uh, uses pigmentation source for uh, um, the converse uh, or the, the eggs when it spawns um, uh, to conserve them, whereas the males only have uh, a slightly change of their skin. Uh, prior to maturation, so they will look nice for the female. Uh, so we believe that maybe the female fish needs more fat and color uh, prior to spawning uh, to be able to uh, to spawn uh, um, with uh, and uh, have that much eggs uh, with the high astaxanthin content or pigmentation source, whereas the male doesn't need that much fat and. Uh, uh, pigment uh, to spawn and you can also see that there is a difference between both uh, the size of uh, uh, fish, uh, male fish can often have uh, or you can have a large proportion of sexual mature male fish whereas that's not that common for female fish. So there is differences between male and female fish, so it can be good to actually um, uh, um, uh, register if there is a male or female fish when you sample fish and try to get an even ratio between male and female fish for quality measures. Um, as this uh, feed uh, with increased protein content, uh, we saw that this really affected the visceral fat content. Um, there can be a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, fat around the, the different organs and uh, by increasing the protein and reducing the fat content, you can increase your slaughter yield and that's mainly due to less uh, storage of visceral fat. Um, and this will also affect uh, the fillet yield um, conversation if you have whole fish. Uh, so increased protein content uh, and reduced in fat can actually um, yield differences when it comes to the slaughter yield and fillet yield. Um, in terms of diseases, uh, we will see that um, quality is highly affected by different diseases. In Norway, we have a lot of pancreas disease, PD, affecting the pancreas of the fish uh, that results in uh, bad uh, breakdown or, or that the fish, um, uh, the pancreas doesn't work properly, so the, um, the uptake of nutrients is reduced. Uh, it leads to a lot of this runt fish, looser fish, and uh, high mortality rates. And uh, you can see here that it often can be seen as this uh, a surface of fat uh, with some pigment uh, since uh, the feed is not digested. Um, so uh, in the work we've been doing, we, we took uh, and tested two different uh, diets, one commercially kind of control, 35 in fat and protein, and then we had a test that was very high in protein, very low in fat content, three dietary treatments per, per um, yeah three replicates per dietary treatment. So what we saw was that we had a disease outbreak in, in July. Uh, prior to this, there was veterinaries there because it was a, a decrease in feed intake. And this was in the south of Norway where we have high temperatures and we have a lot of um, high density of, of farms and often PD is a big problem. Uh, often outbreaks is in June, July. Uh, here we got the outbreak of the disease in July um, and um, uh, we saw right away that it triggered mortality. Uh, the um, uh, uh, large, uh, there were two groups here, the large fish of 1.9 kilos and a small fish group of 1.3 kilos uh, at the time point of 1st of July. We saw that the, uh, the large fish uh, had lower mortality in general than the small fish uh, and we also saw that the test feed with increased protein and reduced fat content, it's a kind of equal to PD feed we have in Norway, uh, reduces the more overall mortality. Um, 
we also had a sampling of the 12th of August uh, where we found um, uh, and saw how the quality was uh, affected by this disease. Uh, we took, uh, as you say, a sampling procedure was followed as I showed you and uh, uh, we found quite systematic um, um, uh, development in condition factor. However, uh, after July and in August when we were there, we can see that the pens are really different and it seems that they uh, reflect the mortality and the severity of the disease. Um, the large test group uh, had uh, non uh, reductions in condition factor versus um, the other groups. Uh, the small control group uh, receiving the high fat control feed had a very high reduction than the small test group. And then you have the two large group doing it better. Uh, we also saw in the pigment content that the fish that was mostly severely affected by the disease had a reduction in pigment content indicating that both the pancreas is uh, affected, so you don't have the, the uptake of the nutrients and also probably stress and disease make the fish use uh, the pigment source here, astaxanthin, as uh, uh, due to, to probably stress uh, and uh, the severity of the disease. Uh, and you can see here how, how the, the different quality aspects reflects the mortality and how increase and reduction in, in, in fat content can reduce the stressor. Um, we believe that the, uh, the uh, breakdown of fat uh, with the lipids from the pancreas and also bile is very important, whereas uh, proteins and especially um, uh, yeah, and comes into the stomach, can be uh, to peptide change and also a brush membrane, border membrane can take up some proteins seemingly like increased fat content during this uh, event uh, is not favorable. Uh, it can be uh, probably negative. Um, that's our, a hypothesis that we have. Um, so actually by following some nice steps uh, with sampling of the fish, you can really detect differences between groups uh, and it can give you a measure of the quality there and then. Uh, and then you can do some assessment. Should we slaughter the fish? How should we treat the fish? Um, do we need to be careful during handling? I mean, this quality and sampling really gives you a, a kind of control uh, and also allows you to, to learn more about your your commercial production. Um, so I think it's important to, to sample fish during the production so you know the, the status. Um, the, the sample at the harvest can detect differences between gender, but also differences between groups. And it allows you as a company or as a research institute, as a feed company to, to see how different factors influence your final product quality. Uh, and then you can go back and find both good and negative aspects uh, and how that probably have affected your production. Uh, so this, uh, this I just show as a kind of tool when we, that we use generally in Ophima to get a better overview of the quality. Uh, and Thomas will go more in depth through quality traits and also how it's measured with also more uh, into um, uh, a bit more detailed. Uh, so that was uh, the presentation and uh, for, uh, I will then receive some questions. Um, so I will just stop sharing my screen. There. Thank you, Dr. Dessen, for this presentation and your time. We know yet that uh, you are at your office now in Norway and it's uh, a bit late in the afternoon there so we really appreciate your availability and your flexibility to be with us during the preparation time of, of, of this webinar. Um, we, we, have, um, we have several questions uh, from the participants um, so I want to spend a couple of minutes to share some questions with, the, um, with you. The questions has been made uh, through the platform, through the chat of the uh, of the platform. So I, I I have some questions here. Uh, the first is, um, have you analyzed 
the impact on final quality due to accelerated growth of fish? Uh, well, we've done some um, tests or, or trials where we see that um, this can, Thomas also can probably uh, say something about this as well, but we see that the very high growth can uh, can lead to to softer fish, uh, not that firm. Um, it could be related to a kind of growth spurt where um, maybe some of the um, um, collagen or structure of the fillet is not not keeping up with the fast growth, and and uh, so very high feed intake, very high high growth factors seems to increase the risk of uh, of uh, um, uh, not that firm uh, texture and probably a bit of gaping so uh, that's that's some of the the results we have uh, have looked at and, and uh, documented uh, in the fema at least oh uh, related to the same uh, question or what you have uh, answered there is another question that uh, asks us, how does density affect gaping in the fish farming? Uh, well, it depends. Um, at least in Norway, I think it's like uh, 25 kilos per cubic meter in terms of the density. That's the maximum. Um, I don't think I have precise data over that, but uh, if the, um, um, yeah, uh, I think gaping, what we see in terms of gaping is more fast growth or disease. Um, and uh, if there is something wrong in the storage of the fish, uh, if it's been exposed to high temperatures or, or so on in terms of uh, storage or, or if you have handled it when it's in rigor, that can really affect the, the gaping. Uh, whereas I don't really know about the fish density. Uh, high density can of course affect, uh, uh, trigger uh, probably uh, uh, some, uh, some hierarchy or, or aggression. Uh, and if it's a competition between the feed, uh, I don't know, maybe that can affect, uh, affect a bit. Uh, but I don't really have the data of the gaping versus density. Uh, but uh, density can trigger stress if it's very dense uh, by increasing the cortisol in the plasma. Uh, whereas I don't know really the, the quality about that, but uh, probably you can have some lactate and, and, uh, and uh, the pH of the muscle is affected by that, but I really don't know the exact effects. Thanks. Um, I remember to the participants in the seminar that uh, you can make uh, every question through the platform, through the chat, uh, at every time you need. Uh, don't forget that it's just to uh, push the bottom and, and, um, and, uh, and, and that's all. Um, we have um, another question, uh, Jens, uh, Jens Herrick. Uh, the third question is for fish greater than 1.5 kilos or two kilos uh, up, how can biometrics be performed? Or it's better to send all the sample fish to the plant to do it there? Yeah, it's um, as bigger the fish is, uh, the most more demanding it is during these um, uh, scoring and handling of the fish at the site. Uh, but we tend to do it uh, over, uh, you know, over two kilos. Uh, it's of course perfect to have a, a 1.5 to two kilo fish. It's very easy to handle. Uh, versus a big fish, it it's, takes more, it's more time consuming. But we also do four or five kilo fish at site. Uh, the most important thing is to have uh, time to do it, uh, to, to be thorough with your analysis and scoring at the site, but also be gentle with the fish, uh, since uh, a lot of handling on big fish can, can really be stressful. Uh, but uh, yeah, anesthetize the fish accordingly to to what you are uh, you use as anesthetization. Uh, be gentle with the fish and um, uh, have uh, um, storage capacity to store them. 
and have a room, either a, a laboratory on the barge uh, or a big boat, so that you can do the scoring and the quality kind of uh, cutting up the fish, scoring the organs, uh, weighing the, the, for example, heart or liver or viscera. Um, and then uh, you can go to the, uh, then you can gut the fish and then store it there on the styrofoam boxes with ice. If it's bad weather or you don't have these conditions at the site or you don't have a, a room indoors or a big boat uh, that, that is not very optimal to, to be at or the weather is bad, you, you can take and sample the fish from the pens and then go into land uh, to a better facility where you have better time. Just be sure to to uh, bleed out the fish and um, um, store it in uh, in cold water, in 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 buckets or these big trays, um, so that it doesn't go into rigor right away. Uh, I it's it's a bit challenging in the summer, but uh, I think it could be done. So if you're true to this concept, uh, you can uh, adjust. But uh, for us, in most of our R&D licenses, we have uh, uh, laboratories or rooms at the barge, feed barge, where we can stand and, and do the scoring and also these kind of uh, other traits. And then we store the fish and transport it by, uh, we, we go by, by car and by plane back to us and we store it there and then we analyze it. I do the analysis of chemical or uh, other properties when it's out of rigor. Uh, if we're going to have uh, do other samples or qPCR or other things that really need attention, you can use this RNA later, or you can use nitrogen at the site, but that demands uh, other measures again. Yeah. But uh, for quality, uh, you can also. Uh, use cutlets and uh, cut them at the site and then send them by ice uh, to anywhere you want. So, uh, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Uh, we have another production. Uh, this is a typical product, uh, proactive question that the, 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 the producers make to us. Based on the, on the difference in weight between female and males, do you recommend sexing before planting or stocking in the at the farm? This is a kind of new um, thinking. It's a very relevant question. Uh, there is now, uh, you can see that several producers that uh, do breathing and so on actually have um, these uh, all female diploid or all female triploid fish. Um, that can be, do, uh, can be used in production either on land in recirculation or in sea to decrease the amount of uh, sexually mature fish as the males, as you say, often is the fast growers and also the fish that has the highest risk of becoming sexually mature. Um, uh, so if uh, I know in Australia, they also sort the fish uh, by uh, um, using uh, uh, ultrasound or other techniques uh, to determine the, the gender or the sex of the fish and then sorting it male, female, so they can slaughter the male out first and then uh, have the female growing longer without the risk of sexual maturity and so on. So I think there is a big um, opportunity there. Uh, and you can also quality grade them uh, since uh, often the females are uh, have a higher condition factor, higher color and fat content. They can probably uh, uh, increase uh, or you can have a bit increase in filler yield and fat and con uh, fat content and color, so they can be more preferable, for example, to filler versus uh, males that can be uh, gutted and uh, transported directly in bulk in 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 styrofoam boxes. So potentially you can can do this uh, and have this called this sorting, uh, but uh, I think it's more used as uh, all female is used when you have the risk of high uh, sexual maturity versus if you do the sorting before you set up the fish, uh, you, um, you can exploit it in a way you can, can use it to your advantage. Whereas I don't think it's that common to sort the fish at the harvest plant or the slaughterhouse. As, uh, but maybe when you have scanners or uh, 
algorithms that that can divide the fish but uh, you, you can probably sort it at the the harvest plant uh, but uh, yeah i don't know we, we only detect that there is a differences between between gender and in quality measures when you come close to harvest size at the season when it's spawning whereas when the fish is smaller it's not that great difference thanks we are receiving um di different questions and yep. um could be probably too many, but uh, in order to keep uh, the time uh, closed, uh, I want to ask you the last question. Um, do you have any studies related uh, to the dense, the relationship between density and welfare of fish? Um, we, I haven't done it, but I know that the Nofima has a research institute at Sundal Soda. They have this recirculation uh, units and they've done some trials uh, with the densities uh, 60 kilos per cubic and up to 100 and 120. And it seems like uh, this density uh, can, uh, or high density, can lead to increased cortisol in, in plasma or the blood and uh, could also lead to more aggression and um, uh, also kind of this fin damage probably due to the aggression if you don't really uh, feed them sufficiently enough uh, but uh, and also there is probably one study that seems to uh, that density can uh, high density can delay wound healing uh, so there seems to be some of these factors that is influenced by, by density. And I think that, uh, uh, yeah, in the FEMA, Lena Sven and others that has, uh, you know, uh, looked more into skin and other properties uh, related to density, you can probably search on that and you will find some kind of uh, more information about that. But density sure has an effect. Uh, it's not that common to, to, to look at density in, in, in C as the cage usually are big and the density is more or less controlled versus on land you need a higher density to produce efficiently and uh, it seems like density then has a very high impact uh, but i cannot say that i have that much experiences with the uh, with density problems in uh, in uh, in sea uh, but this seems to be more a problem with high densities in well boats by transportation or so on but then it's also other things like oxygen supply, high temperatures that can affect and stress the fish negative in a negative way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jens Herik Dessen. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate your availability. Uh, I know that uh, we will keep going. Um, we'll keep in touch in the future. You are part of our TNC and um, uh, probably we will see you again in a in a in a very short time in probably in another webinar or another instance for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Una de las eh, uno de los objetivos de Salmo Food es proporcionar al mercado eh, soluciones nutricionales confiables y hechas a la medida de nuestros clientes. Es por esto que desde hace un par de años hemos estado trabajando intensamente en nuestro centro experimental ubicado en Quillaype, lo que nosotros llamamos el CEA, Centro Experimental Acuícola. El propósito de, de este trabajo ha sido estar en permanente evaluación o someter a permanente evaluación los resultados productivos de dietas, eh, de las últimas dietas lanzadas, y también de nuestros care blocks. Uno de ellos, y probablemente el más usado eh, eh, por eh, por todos nuestros clientes es el blog Skin G. Skin G tiene como finalidad eh, la protección adecuada y la reparación de la piel y agallas en, eh, de, después de haber sufrido algún, algún daño. Eh, no quiero dejar pasar esta oportunidad en donde estamos hablando de calidad de filete, pero, pero en general calidad de pescado. Eh, eh, dejar pasar la oportunidad de mostrarles un video introductorio para aquellos que no lo conocen y algunos que sí ya lo conocen. Eh, 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 volver a, a reforzarles algunas ideas del blog SkinG. Los dejo con el video.
Continuing with the schedule of our webinar, I want to introduce you Dr. Thomas Larson. Dr. Larson worked as a scientist within the Department of Nutrition and Feed Technology. He is responsible for the Product Quality Fish Lab at Nofima OS. Dr. Larson received his PhD within the field of fish quality from the University of Life Sciences in Norway in 2012. He holds a Master of Science, Science Biology from the Uppsala University in Sweden. His primary research area involved fillet quality of farm salmon related to disease, feed and feeding, and production parameters. He is also involved in the development of method for predicting quality parameters, such as fillet color, fat and pigment content, by image analysis. I leave you with Dr. Thomas Larson, who will present us dark spots in salmon fillet, fillet firmness, molecular basis. Dr. Larson, please go ahead. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for um, arranging this um, webinar. Then I will uh, share my screen. Uh, so, now we will um, move uh, more towards um, the land base uh, when the fish has been killed, um, rather than uh, more about the sea, what Jan Serik was talking about. But um, the two pre presentations overlap a bit, so just bear with us. Um, and uh, first, we'll talk a bit uh, general about uh, about uh, product quality and fillet quality, as as Jens Erik has mentioned a few things already. But we'll briefly go through that. Then we will talk about uh, dark spots in salmon fillets, which is a large uh, problem in um, in the salmon farming today. Uh, and then we will have an example of. Um, of research on product quality uh, from my PhD as, as an example, um, where we will talk about fillet firmness mainly as the main quality parameter. So um, important quality parameters are as we as we talked about before, the color and appearance of um, of the fillets, the fat content, the type of fat, uh, texture or fillet firmness, as we will talk more about later. We mentioned gaping and the shape of the fish, shape of the fillet can be important. Uh, freshness, of course. And these quality parameters, they mean very different things to different people. For example, for consumers, many of these are, are very important, obviously, uh, with color and appearance perhaps being the most important. Uh, fillet yield, for example, can be a more um, a, a quality parameter more interesting for the producer and um, from a financial perspective, and the consumer is perhaps not so interested in that. Um, and when we when we work with uh, quality, we have to uh, take into consideration. Of course, everything that Jens Erik talked about in the C phase, we want to know. How was the production? What were the incidents during the timeline that we saw before? Were there any lice treatments and so on that can explain any, any deviations or differences that we see uh, so that we can deduct what are the real differences that we are actually uh, interested in. Uh, and for this, um, we have to take into consideration uh, the rigor of the fish as we, as we talked about. Uh, stress can influence the time uh, of onset and the total time. And of course, we don't want to uh, analyze the quality of fish that are in Riger because it can, it can mislead us. Uh, for example, the color can be much higher of um, a fish in Riger as the muscle is contracted and the concentration of pigment visually is, is higher simply because the muscle is in contraction and not because of any, uh, for example, dietary treatment differences. Um, and then we have to take into consideration the, um, the whole fish, the organs, the liver, the viscera, um, 
to get a general health status of the fish from, from a quality perspective. And this Jens Erik has, has uh, talked through quite a bit, so I will not mention too much. And then, of course, we move on to the fillet, which is perhaps the most in interesting part. But again, as I mentioned, um, there's no need in looking at the fillet unless we know all these other things as well. And uh, that also means that uh, quality as, as the end product is, of course, relevant for most topics like um, fish health and welfare, genetics, nutrition, and so on. Um, and many things have been shown to influence quality and, and, um, and most of these topics are interested in um, finding out how it influences the, the end product as this has to be acceptable in order to, uh, to achieve consumer acceptance. Um, and another aspect of uh, quality is that um, it also needs to uh, be sufficient for uh, the technical quality also has to be sufficient uh, so that the producers can, can process the fish, for example, filleting in, in filleting machines the, the fish needs to be of a certain quality to, to withstand this, um, the treatment, if you may, um, and come out on the other side as a nice product. So just shortly about some of the methods that we, that we apply here. Um, as uh, Jens Erik has mentioned some of these as well. Um, and I mentioned the general condition of the fish, and then we use, for example, this fish well uh, scoring system that was mentioned to look at, for example, scale loss and cataract and fin damage to, to get the general assessment of how the fish uh, was, uh, was doing in, in, uh, in living life. And the, we look at the skin. The, it's a, the skin is a very hot topic these days, and uh, we apply um, image analysis as well as mechanical analysis to, to uh, determine this. Um, of course, the biometrics are important uh, and critical, the weight and length and condition factors, so on. Um, and the yields, obviously, uh, very important, as um, Jens Erik talked more about that. And then we, as I mentioned, look at the, the organs, um, the weights of the organs and the appearance uh, to get, the, the, again, the, the full picture of how, how this fish was living its life and how it was doing. And how then, in the end, this relates to the quality of the fish. Um, we also use uh, the quality index method to assess uh, freshness of the fish to, uh, to predict remaining shelf life. And I will come back to that uh, briefly. And uh, please don't uh, look at the, the whole list. I'm sorry for the many words, but um, when we then move to the fillet, we, um, depending on the questions of the research in progress, of course, uh, we look at things like the firmness um, and the thickness of the fillet and the thickness then relates to uh, the fillet yield. Uh, the appearance, of course, is uh, quite central in, in all uh, research in this field, where, whether it's the color, the level of color, or the evenness of color, which is uh, um, very important as well. And what we will talk a bit about later, the, the discoloration of, for example, these melanin dark spots. Uh, gaping, liquid holding capacity can be other uh, relevant methods. Um, muscle histology, I will come back to that a bit, but um, then we're moving into the more microscopical aspects to, to learn about what is explaining these, the mac macroscopical findings on, on the fillet. Is, it, is there some something we can see from histology, for example, the morphology of the muscle fibers or the morphology of the um, liver or heart or other tissues. And then, of course, chemical analysis of different tissues, uh, especially fat and fatty acids. Uh, gene expression is an important tool 
to uh, to discover underlying molecular causes of of um, quality differences. And enzyme activity, for example, uh, can be applied. And we often use also the sensory panel, which is a great, uh, very sensitive instrument to to get many quality aspects at once uh, from all the different uh, um, sensory aspects of that uh, this kind of panel can provide. Uh, and then in the end, we have to look at the data and apply statistics. Um, and here, the gender of the fish is uh, extremely important to know, as, as Jan Serik mentioned. And especially in this case, because now we have moved on to land and we cannot always go to the site and choose the fish that we are looking at. Sometimes it's provided to us and maybe we cannot choose equal amount of males and equal amount of females so um, we have to know the sex of the fish because it affects the quality uh, at uh, a lot and that's why it's very important to know in order to to uh, apply in the statistics to to get results that we can trust and that mean something and uh, as Jens Erik also mentioned, the, the fish size, uh, so this relates back to the sampling routines that uh, Jens Erik ex explained very nicely. So uh, the, for us, this is, um, of course, uh, very critical. Uh, I mentioned uh, freshness by this quality index method. Just want to mention it as an example. So it's a relatively simple sensorical evaluation of the freshness of the fish, where you look at the skin, the eyes, gills, and abdominal cavity of the fish in order to, uh, to get a score, which is then um, used to predict the, the remaining shelf life of the fish. And this is, of course, important for consumer acceptance. They would like to buy a fresh fish but also for the, for the merchants who are buying the fish from the producer. They want to know that they can, they can buy the fish, transport it to them, store it for a while, and it will still be a nice uh, quality fish that the consumers will accept. So the results here show just an example of um, fish from, from the same producer from two different sites, and these fish were harvested on the same day. And uh, day four, Postmortem PM stands for postmortem. Uh, the remaining shelf life was uh, quite similar, and but we see at day 16 postmortem there's a big difference between these two groups, and this can of course be very uh, helpful and relevant information for a producer to to uh, learn about what they can potentially improve um, at in this case site two or sorry site one in order to improve the, the shelf life. Something with the processes, cooling of the fish or trans length of time or transport to the harvest site and so on. So fillet firmness or texture as um, we can also call it. Um, we will come back to that as I mentioned in, in the, the example I will show later. Um, also an important quality trait, uh, both for consumer acceptance, then related to the mouth experience when you eat salmon. We want um, relatively firm uh, muscle and not, not soft muscle in contrast with uh, beef, for example, where we want a very tender muscle. Um, but as I mentioned, this is also important for uh, processing uh, the, the muscle needs to be firm enough to be able to handle different types of processing, perhaps especially filleting. If the muscle is too soft, then the muscle can be destroyed during these kind of activities. Uh, we measure this usually instrumentally, and this uh, method has been shown to correlate to the sensorical perception of chewing resistance. And this is where this sensory panel can come in very nicely and in order to develop these kind of methods. And the, the fillet um, that you can see, is it's just to show that usually we have to measure at several points throughout the fillet because 
fish fillets in general are not very homogeneous pieces of muscle. That's a, it, they vary a lot in both fat content and, and color and also fillet firmness or muscle texture throughout the fillet, which is why it's important to, to standardize, with, standardize, which of course is um, uh, a general thing that we have to consider. Uh, but also, um, also that we need to measure throughout at, at different positions if, if we want to learn uh, the full picture. So this is an example, or the, yeah, this is from um, the population that we will look at later. Uh, these are the data of filet firmness um, from 944 uh, salmon. And this is showing the frequency distribution. And at the bottom, you see the, the filet firmness expressed in Newton. And this is, in this case, the force it takes to puncture the fillet with a certain, um, with a certain probe, as we saw in the previous picture. And um, this, this is meant as an example, of, in general, for quality parameters that uh, this can be a normal situation. We see a quite nice, normally distributed curve. And uh, of course, some fish will be uh, below a certain threshold, in this case on, on uh, eight newtons. And they, these fish are either um, have soft muscle or are prone to being soft. And then we have fish also above a certain threshold, which, which can be too hard, which is not... Uh, nice for the consumer when, when uh, you chew on it. It's, it's too firm, too hard, and that can be uh, rejected by consumers. So, but what is, um, can be challenging is that when this population um, suddenly gets some, some issues in, in their life, like uh, lice treatments or suddenly much warmer water, perhaps this, this distribution will shift towards the lower values and a higher proportion of the fish will be uh, below this threshold where, uh, where the muscle is soft. So the general idea is to find causes of these kind of uh, um, causes of these quality parameters in order to, to shift the distribution in the, in the correct direction, in this case to the right. Uh, to higher values and perhaps also make the distribution more narrow. So of course that is that is uh, the purpose uh, of what we do in general and what we want to achieve. Uh, I mentioned uh, histology as a tool and this is just as an example to to show how how it can be a re re very relevant tool and um, On the left, we see um, a, a very normal uh, muscle, very nicely shaped muscle fibers with no, um, or at least almost no um, uh, destroyed muscles. But to the right, we see a lot of um, um, destroyed muscle cells. And uh, these were from a group, these were from a group of fish, which also had um, softer muscle actually. So these can give us uh, clues about why a group has, for example, softer muscle um, compared to another group. Uh, we talked quite a bit about color already and I just want to mention it a bit more because it is a very uh, challenging quality parameter. I've learned that in Chile, you also use this, um, this Salmofan, which is shown in the picture. Um, and that's a great tool. And the great thing is that we can then speak the same language. The problem is that we all have very different color vision. And, uh, and using this Salmofan manually can lead to extremely different results, uh, which is why it's important to have objective uh, methods for determining color. In, especially in a species like, like salmon, where the color uh, is so, such an important quality parameter. So we, we work quite a lot with that. For example, with this uh, photofish, as uh, Jens Erik mentioned, to, to develop an, uh, objective methods. 
we also use uh, colorimetric analysis by um, this little device, which is called the Minolta. Um, and these are examples that of, of um, instruments that we can use to get more, hopefully, more objective um, uh, values of color. And um, but as we can perhaps imagine is that we need a reference and when the problem with with color is that we determine color in very different ways then what is the reference and again we turn to the sensory panel which i mentioned is a very sensitive instrument actually these people because you can calibrate them they are so well trained that you can actually calibrate them and once they have been calibrated they give in this case the most objective um, values that we can get for such a parameter. So that is usually what we have as the basis for developing these kind of methods. So then we will uh, talk a bit about dark spots in salmon fillets. And then uh, this graph shows the development um, in Norway from 1995 until almost today. And um, some of these results are, are anecdotal and, and the later results are um, more official because the, the industry started to struggle with this problem in uh, between 2010 and 2015. And there were money put into research on this and uh, we started getting proper data. But uh, probably it's, uh, it's uh, relatively correct, this graph, uh, with low, low uh, pre pre prevalence in, the 19, in 1995 and increasing un until today, um, except for the past couple of years where it's been kind of flattening out or maybe even reduced a little bit, but not significantly. Um, and most of you are probably aware of this uh, problem, but um, they look approximately like in these pictures. They can be very different in both size and, and appearance. Um, and uh, most of the spots are situated uh, in the cranioventral fillet part, so in the, in the front ventral part in the belly. And most of them are grayish or black, but they can also be be red, as you probably know. And this then is uh, one of the um, one of the uh, biggest um, problems in um, uh, quality problems in the Norwegian aquaculture industry, and that's why there's uh, a lot of money put into research on this issue. Um, and I will just show a few things that we have learned. Um, here we see. Um, uh, organic salmon, uh, organically produced salmon compared to conventionally produced salmon from the same, um, from the same producer. Um, and on the x-axis we have the, the frequency of dark spots in intervals and we can see that um, the, organic, the organically produced salmon have uh, on average fewer uh, fish with these dark spots than the conventional fish. Uh, we have seen some nutritional effects uh, on dark spots and um, on the y-axis uh, we have reduced or increased uh, proportion of stained muscle segments. It says myotomes but it's um, this means um, number of muscle segments uh, counted on a fillet which are discolored. So we have seen that the effect uh, that vitamin E and selenium addition uh, into the diet can have a positive effect reducing the this number of stained muscle segments and we also see uh, a similar uh, picture with uh, when we also include vitamin C. Uh, when we in, uh, include marine microalgae in the in the diet, we also see a reduction, as you can see. Although this um, this number is a bit misleading because this fish population had very low 
um, low uh, prevalence of these dark spots in on average in general. So um, this 95% is a bit uh, misleading, but still there was a significant effect of these algae. Uh, adding copper to the to the diet has been shown to increase the prevalence, and uh, this is um, assumed to be associated with the 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 synthesis pathway of melanin, where copper is um, uh, a critical cofactor for one of the enzymes involved in this pathway. So this kind of makes sense. And this is also part of the ongoing research into this uh, issue. Um, other positive nutritional effects have been shown to be uh, EPA and DHA. In the graph here, we see on the x-axis increasing levels of uh, EPA and DHA from, from levels uh, which are uh, considered too low for fish health up to levels um, more similar to the, the recipes back in uh, back in 1995, perhaps with more uh, with only marine ingredients in the feed. And we're, there was a, a marked reduce, reduction in prevalence of dark spots in, in the, the fillets with higher inclusion level of uh, EPA and DHA. Uh, inclusion of krill has also uh, shown some positive effects on dark spots. So there has been some, um, some papers on, um, from all this work about um, uh, what we know about these dark spots, uh, and but we do not know the cause of the dark spots, which is why this research is is ongoing still. We know, as I mentioned, a few things that can help reduce prevalence, but we don't know the cause. Uh, so what we do know is is how the spots uh, look and how they look microscopic microscopically, and also how the gene expression. Um, varies between affected muscle compared to normal muscle and um, yeah so the ongoing research here is uh, in Norway it's sponsored by the Norwegian Seafood Research Fund uh, as since the industry is, is uh, very keen on coming to terms with this problem or at least finding ways to reduce the prevalence so at Nofima, we have the, the one on the left, which is called dark spots in salmon fillets, causes and actions for reducing prevalence. Uh, and at uh, the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, they have the one on the right uh, called red spots and transition to black spots in salmon fillets. And uh, this uh, Norwegian research, uh, seafood research fund um, are keen on having these projects collaborate. So um, to, to get the most out of uh, the knowledge which is produced. And uh, in this ongoing research, I will just mention a few examples of what is going on. For example, uh, we are using cell trials as one tool um, by, uh, where, where we can add certain components to, to the cells and see how the pathway of producing um, melanin is affected. So for example, we can add serum of or, um, or plasma from, from the fish that I mentioned that got uh, different inclusion levels of EPA and DHA to these cells and see how, if this also affects the, the melanin synthesis pathway. So these kind of um, approaches are being applied in, in the current research. We're also looking into the association between, uh, between bones and dark spots because, most, as I mentioned, most of the spots are um, situated in the ventral part of the fish um, in association with the ribs. Uh, and so we are applying X-rays and micro CTs, for example, to, uh, to combined with histology and immunohistochemistry to, to see if there's a link between uh, these factors. Um, and we are also studying wild salmon as a um, kind of reference to have something to relate to. 
and there are also dietary trials uh, ongoing as well to to further uh, further investigate the um, inclusion of certain components and how that affects dark spots so then we will move on to um, an example of um, of uh, research on quality where uh, which is about fillet firmness of uh, Atlantic salmon fillets as I mentioned and uh, this is from my PhD and it's about the molecular basis of fillet firmness because this this trait uh, back in uh, in in this time around 2009 or 10 it was not very well uh, characterized from a molecular point of view so um, I will um, yeah, and it, it's um, affected by many factors that we knew, that it's affected by genetics, uh, feed and feeding, and also how you process the fish um, uh, after, it, after it's harvested. Uh, but we didn't know much about the, the living, the molecular features associated with this trait in the, in the living animal. <clears throat> so um, here's the, the uh, simplified approach to, um, to learning uh, about this uh, this trait, so first we wanted to determine the gene expression profile, uh, which then can tell us about which molecular factors and pathways in the living animal are associated with uh, fillet firmness. So based on the knowledge here, um, in step two, we the aim was to design a feed to add a certain component, for example. Uh, that would fit with the knowledge that we generated and hopefully this would um, result in in summer fillets with um, firmer fillets. So step one, uh, gene expression profiling of soft and firm salmon fillet. So uh, we had this uh, fish material which, which was a family material and um, they were uh, grown at our previous research station at the position shown in, in red here in Norway. And it was a salmon breed population. And this is the same graph as you, as you saw before, uh, just to remind you. And also uh, to show you that since this was a family population, there was a calculation of heritability done for this trait. And the heritability was found to be 0 0.16. In other words, 16% uh, of the, the variation in this trait could be explained by genetics. In other words, it's a low to moderate um, heritability, meaning it could be applied in uh, selection programs um, to, to improve this trait, uh, most likely. But uh, since it's uh, this is a destructive trait, you have to kill the fish and remove the fillet and measure the firmness in order to get the data uh, perhaps it's not so realistic and i'm not sure if if any breeding companies are doing this actually and yeah this was exactly the same figure so in this population we had um, again we have the firmness of the fillet on the x-axis and this blue line shows uh, the variation so from relatively low numbers on five, six Newtons up to very high. And we selected 16 individuals from this population that you can see as, as blue dots. So in order to achieve um, selected individuals that represent the whole, the whole scale of, um, of fillet firmness. And um, on these individuals, we applied um, microarray in order to study the gene expression. And back then, a microarray was a relatively new thing to apply for this kind of research, not new in the world, but new to, new to uh, the quality world, if we can call it that. And so um, a microarray was designed for, for being able to study the genes uh, relevant for this approach. And uh, these are some of the results, and please don't uh, look at all the details, but uh, just to explain the principles and the main results. So 
what was interesting with this approach was that we had this um, range of filet firmness. In this case, in, in these graphs, they are uh, normalized around zero. So they go from on the x-axis. So you see firmness on the x-axis going from approximately minus seven up to positive um, eight. So what was interesting with this approach was that we could make a correlation, a regression between uh, firmness of the muscle and gene expression. And um, if we look at figure C called lipid metabolism, we can see a very strong positive correlation between muscle firmness and gene expression. And in, and in these gra graphs, the gene expression is the average gene expression from all the genes involved in each of these functional groups. So for example, lipid metabolism is a functional group consisting of, of many genes involved in, uh, in lipid metabolism. Um, and only the significant genes are included here, obviously. Uh, so the results uh, show that, well, we can see um, in figure D, mitochondrial genes, also positive correlation. Whereas uh, figure E shows a negative correlation with sugar metabolism. Um, and I will just go to the conclusion um, instead of showing you all these details. So one thing we saw was that microarray technology or to be honest, any gene expression tool that can study a lot of genes at the same time, at least uh, was well suited for analyzing a trait like this, where we have limited molecular knowledge. Uh, we learned a lot about the molecular basis of uh, salmon fillet firmness, and we saw that firm fillets were associated with um, an aerobic metabolism using lipids as fuel. And we saw that uh, there was an association with rapid removal of damaged proteins. Um, and this was interpreted as uh, a good turn turnover of the muscle in order to maintain a, a functional muscle. And um, as I mentioned, it's, it's also seemed possible to improve filiform firmness through selective breeding since the heritability was um, at least not very low. So then this knowledge, um, we tried to apply it to um, to uh, design a feed to uh, achieve firmer fillets. So uh, we designed a feed with uh, supplemented with glutamate, glutamic acid. And uh, this glutamic acid um, will not go through the details of this uh, amino acid, but um, the characteristics of this amino acid um, made it fit very well with the knowledge that we achieved in, in step one. Uh, so that's that's why it was chosen. Um, so again, at the same uh, research facilities, we uh, let the fish grow from from sea transfer up to three kilos with a control group and um, and this glutamate diet as well, of course. Um, and there was no effect on the weight or growth of the fish uh, between between these experimental diets. Um, and this is the firmness, a bit lower variation between in, in this fish, fish population, but uh, in this case, it doesn't matter as I will show you. Um, so here we have uh, the control fish and the glutamate fish and the firmness of their fillets at day five post-mortem, day 12 post-mortem, and also after frozen storage. So we see after day five that there was no significant difference, even though there was a trend for firmer fillets in the glutamate group. Uh, after day 12, uh, at day 12, the, this uh, difference was significant. And um, especially after uh, frozen storage, the difference was higher and, and also significant. So it appeared that this diet uh, resulted in, in firmer fillets uh, than, this con than the control group. And uh, the, this glutamate group also had fewer ad adhesions in the organs, and the livers were smaller and leaner uh, of these fish. 
And what fit very well was that the, the enzyme alanine aminotransferase was also lower in the plasma of, um, of these fish, uh, which is, a, this is an indicator of uh, liver damage. So lower levels um, uh, fit well with the smaller and leaner liver, livers. Uh, but the livers looked different histopathologically uh, and the fatty acid profiles of the livers were also similar. Uh, this glutamate diet seemed to affect the, the fat metabolism um, and there was a tendency of uh, more uh, omega-3 fatty acids in the glutamate group, although not significant. Um, and uh, most importantly, perhaps, we also saw upregulation of 47 mitochondrial genes, indicating um, a higher level of aerobic metabolism in the fish of this glutamate group. And this, if you remember back, this is um, very similar to the gene expression profile that we found in step one. So this looked very promising um, that this glutam glutamate supplementation uh, resulted in a similar metabolic effect and also firmer uh, fillets. Uh, what was interesting was that the, the glutamate group had more changes in the muscle that were considered uh, de degenerative. So here we see some uh, normal muscle fibers and some that look a bit um, destroyed and are degenerative. Uh, but at the same time, the, the, an enzyme that indicates muscle damage was actually lower in the plasma of the glutamate group. Uh, the gene expression also showed an upregulated cell cycle uh, and the muscle had a higher pH, indicating um, a better energy status of that fish. So um, if we remember back to step one, we, we saw that there was a higher turnover um, or proteins in the muscle of the fish that had higher um, or firmer fillets. So this, it, we didn't have the same evidence, but these findings um, seem to support this idea. So overall, um, improved fillet firmness with this uh, diet, uh, similar metabolic profile to, uh, to this step one. And it seemed to be possible then to stimulate an aerobic metabolism by this supplementation. Um, no effect on growth, but as we mentioned, positive effects on firmness and health parameters. So this can indicate that um, it's not always ideal to, to base um, optimal levels of certain ingredients uh, only on growth, but also uh, take into consideration uh, fish health or even fill equality to determine what levels um, of ingredients are required for a good fish life. <clears throat> and then I will just uh, finish shortly with um, the last piece of the, the work in this thesis, which was related to quality of fish with uh, pancreas disease or PD. And um, here we had a, a fish population that, uh, that got an out, outbreak of PD. Uh, and when a population gets affected by this kind of disease, the variation within a, a huge net pen or within many net pens of a big site, um, it varies a lot in the, between individual fish. So many of the fish were seemingly healthy whereas many fish were very uh, skinny and, um, and uh, was obviously affected. Uh, the, the pancreas was affected, they didn't eat, they didn't swim normally, etc. So we obtained fish that we could uh, divide up into these three groups, uh, A, B, and C, where the first one was seemingly healthy and, and was negative for the virus causing this disease, the Salmonid alpavirus, SAV. Uh, group B also seemed healthy, but it was positive for the virus, but not for the disease. And this group C was um, completely ill. And you can see this fillet was very skinny and pale and even some dark spot in there. And, uh, and this group also had a very low condition factor and, and lots of histopathological changes. So this uh, 
worstly affected group C had a very low protein content in the in the muscle, and the, both the fatty acid and amino acid profile was affected, and the the amino acid profile uh, revealed that uh, there was a lot of collagen in the muscle, even though the protein content was lower, the the collagen content was uh, very high. And this is probably um, was probably scar tissue uh, repairing the damaged muscle, and the fillets were abnormally hard. And here are the results on fillet firmness from these fish. Uh, so the the group C was very different from the other two groups. And just to mention the um, gene expression, which in this case was of heart, it showed a uh, uh, a strong reduction of of um, energy metabolism in general and also cell proliferation. So these fish were really struggling and we saw again that in this case two hard fillets um, was also associated with um, a change in energy metabolism. And um, so when we have proper pancreas de disease um, developed we get poor nutritional status and unacceptable fillet quality. And so the conclusions of this thesis was that um, uh, there were molecular processes that could be associated with filial firmness in the living animal and that we would prefer an uh, active aerobic metabolism uh, to achieve a firm muscle and that we could stimulate this by dietary glutamate supplementation. And um, that perhaps it's not always growth that should be the the key for finding optimal dietary nutritional requirements but perhaps also fish health and quality should be taken into consideration and uh, with that i would like to say thank you for your attention thank you very much and i will stop to share my screen Thank you, Dr. Larson, for this helpful presentation. Dr. Larson is also part of the researcher who works uh, with our feed tech team in Salmo Food. Every year, at least four times a year, our technical teams meet with uh, a scientific group coming from Nofima and other research partners, partners linked to the salmon industry. This work has been and continued for since uh, 25 years ago. Again, uh, Dr. Larson, we have uh, uh, several questions from the participants. These questions also has been made uh, through the, the, the platform and we want to try to approach all of them, but uh, there are many of them. The first question is, um, how many days of uh, fasting and um, fasting or um, no feeding are there until the fish diets, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. How many days of fasting are there until the fish dies at harvest? Until the fish dies? Uh, yes. Or, or you mean until it's harvested? Uh, actually, I, I received this uh, question, but uh, I, I think, um, I think I understand, yeah. Um, so starvation time is actually a um, quite discussed uh, topic. And some markets, especially in the UK, I believe, have some, um, some guidelines where they say that fish should be maximum starved for 72 hours before harvest. Um, and that this is related to welfare of the fish and so on. But there is no great uh, documentation of, uh, of any of this. There has been a lot of re research on um, starvation time related to, to quality and the yield and the, the financial aspects of that. But um, in my experience, the average that I have seen based on lots of in, in registrations from the industry is around 10 days but it varies a lot. Um, when we talk about research purpose, we have as a rule of thumb um, 
de that it depends on the temperature in the sea, obviously, and that we want to starve the fish as little as possible, but at the same time, really making sure that the, the bowels are empty. Um, which, of course, is what the industry also has to make sure for uh, consumer safety. Um, and then it's one, one day for um, when it's 15 degrees, two days when it's 10 degrees, and, uh, and three days when it's five, as a approximate number. Thank you. Um... You show in, during the, your presentation. You show you show a, 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 an instrument that you use to measure the uh, texture or the firmness of the uh, of the fillet. Um, what kind of instrument do you use to measure firmness? Um, in terms of the shape, it is a, a round or sharp shape. What 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 kind of of uh, what is the measure that you are doing with the with the fillet? Oh yes, so th the question is related to the what is actually pressing into the fillet. Yes. And that is, um, it's a cylinder, a flat ended cylinder. So it's completely flat on the bottom and it's around, yeah, it's a cylinder simply. And uh, it is uh, half an inch in diameter, 12.5 millimeters approximately, I think and um, basically resembling uh, a finger or perhaps even a, a tooth for chewing with. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, we have uh, two uh, questions related to the uh, production and, and, and diets. What time, um, what do you think that uh, the organic production produced in terms of uh, dark spots. Why the organic production reduced dark spots, in your opinion? In my opinion, um, yeah, it's a very difficult question because there are so many factors involved. Uh, one thing is that organically produced salmon or organic producers are not allowed to um, to use chemicals on their on the net pens on the on the nets it's themselves like uh, copper, and um, uh, since we know that including copper in the diet increases the prevalence of dark spots, and what we know about the copper being involved in this um, this pathway of melanin synthesis, it is a reasonable idea to think that uh, this is at least part of it. But um, I should say we, we don't have one answer. Uh, there are also organic um, uh, feed ingredients in, uh, at least in Norwegian organic production. Um, so that could also be, uh, for example, the, the pigment source has to be organic. And the fish are, uh, they use less chemicals for treating against lice and disease. So, um, yeah, and there's also the aspect of uh, lower density in the net pens. Uh, they're not allowed to have the, the conventional 25 kilos per cubic, but it's, um, I don't remember the limit, but I think it's 15. So there, there are many aspects. What type of, uh, what type of diet could uh, reduce gaping, considering the uh, actual accelerated growth of fish. What kind of diet would reduce gaping? That would um, um, gaping is when the when the muscle segments separate from the when they lose the connection to the myocomata. This means that the connective tissue binding the the muscle fibers together with the with the myocomata or myosepta is weak, or at least weaker than. Uh, in normal cases. So I would assume that um, a diet with uh, components that ensure that, that the connective tissue is uh, able to, to follow the strong growth would help in this case. But I'm not aware of any research that has shown uh, which components specifically would help. 
just to be finishing, we have the last question. Um, have you been able to evaluate the effect of melanosis and the competitive percentage of, uh, for trout and uh, Atlantic? Do you think that there are differences between one species and an another and another? Yes, we have looked at, uh, at um, rainbow trout as well. And the prevalence there is very low. It's, uh, it has been around two, three, maybe 4% on average. And it hasn't seemed to increase in the same way as, as uh, it has for the salmon. So that is, um, it is part of the research objectives although the focus was a bit higher some years ago, but um, it's still an interesting species to follow uh, since it, it has much lower prevalence and also seems to not increase as the salmon does. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Thank you, Jen Serik Dessen. Uh, and thank you for all this team that uh, make possible this uh, webinar today. Um, ya estamos empezando a cerrar. Um, estamos dentro del tiempo. Habíamos programado que esto cerrara a las aproximadamente a las 11. Son, según mi reloj, tres para las 11, así que estamos dentro de, de horario. Les agradezco no solamente a los, um, a los expositores, como dije recién, también eh, agradezco a quienes hicieron posible que esto se realizara. Pero también a todos ustedes que participaron. Tenemos una cantidad importante de, 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 de registrados o de, de, de conectados hoy día. Y, y como, como dije al principio, creo que este tipo de formatos eh, remotos se van a mantener en la medida que eh, dure la pandemia. Esperamos sin duda que en la medida que la situación sanitaria vaya cambiando, poder volver a encontrarnos todos juntos, poder volver a tener esa, la oportunidad de compartir y de tener este tipo de experiencias eh, de manera eh, física. Así que les doy las gracias a todos, esperamos volver a encontrarnos. Eh, tengan eh, por seguro que eh, este tipo de capacitaciones o de seminarios van a seguir eh, estando presentes dentro de la oferta de Salmo Food. Así que en pronto, en poco tiempo más, vamos a eh, volver a conectarnos. Esperemos volver a vernos pronto. Muchas gracias. Nos vemos.